Chapter 10. I Ruin a Perfectly Good Bus It didn't take me long to pack. I decided to leave the Minotaur horn in my cabin, which left me only an extra change of clothes and a toothbrush to stuff in a backpack Grover had found for me. The camp store loaned me $100 in mortal money and 20 golden drachmas. These coins were as big as Girl Scout cookies and had images of various Greek gods stamped on one side and the Empire State Building on the other. The ancient mortal drachmas had been silver, Chiron told us, but Olympians never used less than pure gold. Chiron said the coins might come in handy for non-mortal transactions, whatever that meant. He gave Ann Beth and me each canteen of nectar and a Ziploc bag full of ambrosia squares to be used only in emergencies if we were seriously hurt. It was god food, Chiron reminded us. It would cure us of almost any injury, but it was lethal to mortals. Too much of it would make a half-blood very, very feverish. An overdose would burn us up, literally. Annabeth was bringing her magic Yankees cap, which he told me had been a 12th birthday present from her mom. She carried a book on famous classic architecture, written in ancient Greek, to read when she got bored, and a long bronze knife, hidden in her shirt sleeve. I was sure the knife would get us busted the first time we went through a metal detector. Grover wore his fake feet and his pants to pass as human. He wore a green Rasta-style cap because, when it rained, his curly hair flattened and you could just see the tips of his horns. His bright orange backpack was full of scrap metal and apples to snack on. In his pocket was a set of reed pipes his daddy goat had carved for him, even though he only knew two songs, Mozart's Piano Concerto No. 12 and Hilary Duff's So Yesterday, both of which sounded pretty bad on reed pipes. We waved goodbye to the other campers, took one last look at the strawberry fields, the ocean, and the big house, then hiked up Half-Blood Hill to the tall pine tree that used to be Thalia, daughter of Zeus. Chiron was waiting for us in his wheelchair. Next to him stood the surfer dude I'd seen when I was recovering in the sick room. According to Grover, the guy was the camp's secu- head of security. He supposedly had eyes all over his body, so he could never be surprised. Today, though, he was wearing a chauffeur's uniform, so I could only see extra pe- peepers on his hands, face, and neck. This is Argus, Chiron told me. He will drive you to the city and, well, keep an eye on things. I heard footsteps behind us. Luke came running up the hill, carrying a pair of basketball shoes. Hey, he panted. Glad I caught you. Annabeth blushed, the way she always did when Luke was around. Luke just wanted to say good good luck, Luke told me. And I thought, "Hmm, maybe you could use these. He handed me the sneakers, which looked pretty normal. They even smelled kind of normal. Luke said, my White bird's wings sprouted out of the heels, startling me so much I dropped them. The shoes flapped around on the ground until the wings folded up and disappeared. Awesome, Grover said. Luke smiled. Those served me well when I was on my quest. Gift from Dad. Of course, I don't use them much these days. His expression turned sad. I didn't know what to say. It was cool enough that Luke had come to say goodbye. I had been afraid he might resent me for getting so much attention the last few days. But here he was giving me a magic gift. It made me blush almost as much as Annabeth. Hey, man, I said. Thanks. Listen, Percy. Luke looked uncomfortable. A lot of hopes are riding on you, so just kill some monsters for me, okay? We shook hands. Luke patted Grover's head between his horns, then gave a goodbye hug to Annabeth, who looked like she might pass out. After Luke was gone, I told her, You're hyperventilating. I'm not. You let him capture the flag instead of you, didn't you? Oh, Why don't you go anywhere? Why do I go anywhere with you, Percy? She stomped down the other side of the hill, where a white SUV waited on the shoulder of the road. Argus followed, jingling his car keys. I picked up the flying shoes and had a sudden bad feeling. I looked at Chiron. I won't be able to use these, will I? He shook his head. Luke meant well, Percy, but taking to the air? That would not be wise for you. I nodded, disappointed. But then I got the idea, got an idea. Hey, Grover, you want a magic item? His eyes lit up. Me? Pretty soon we laced the sneakers over his fake feet, and the world's first flying goat boy was ready for launch. Mai! he shouted. He got off the ground okay, but then fell over sideways so his backpack dragged through the grass. The winged shoes kept bucking up and down like a tiny bronco. Practice, Chiron called after him. You just need practice. Ah! Grover went flying sideways, down the hill like a possessed lawnmower, heading toward the van. 
Before I could follow, Chiron caught my arm. I should have trained you better, Percy, he said. If only I had more time. Hercules, Jason, they all got more training. It's okay. I just wish. I stopped myself because I was about to sound like a brat. I was wishing my dad had given me a cool magic item instead of to help on this quest. Something as good as Luke's flying shoes or Annabeth's invisible cap. What am I thinking? Chiron cried. I can't let you get away without this. He pulled a pen from his coat pocket and handed it to me. It was an ordinary disposable ballpoint, black ink, removable cap, probably cost 30 cents. Gee, I said, thanks. Percy, that's a gift from your father. I've kept it for years, not knowing you were who, who I was waiting for, but the prophecy is clear to me now. You are the one. I remember the field trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Art when I'd vaporized Mrs. Dodds. Chiron had thrown me a pen that turned into a sword. Could this be? I took off the cap, and the pen grew longer and heavier in my hand. In half a second, I held the shimmering bronze sword with a double-edged blade, a leather-wrapped grip, and a f flat hilt riveted with gold studs. It was the first weapon that actually felt balanced in my hand. The sword has a long and tragic history that we need not go into, Chiron told me. Its name is Anaclosmus. Riptide, I translated, surprised the ancient Greek came so easily. Use it only for emergencies, Chiron said, and only against monsters. No hero should harm mortals unless absolutely necessary, of course, but this sword wouldn't harm them in any way in any case. I looked at the wickedly sharp blade. What do you mean it wouldn't harm mortals? How could it not? The sword is celestial bronze, forged by the Cyclops, tempered in the heart of Mount Etna, cooled in the river Leith. It's deadly to monsters, to any creature from the underworld, provided they don't kill you first. But the blade will pass through mortals like an illusion. They simply are not important enough for the blade to kill. And I should warn you, as a demigod, you can be killed by either celestial or normal weapons. You are twice as vulnerable. Good to know. Now, recap the pen. I touched the pen cap to the sword tip, and instantly Riptide shrank to a ballpoint pen again. I tucked it in my pocket, a little nervous because I was famous for losing pens at school. You can't, Chiron said. Can't what? Lose the pen, he said. It is enchanted. It will always reappear in your pocket. Try it. I was wary, but I threw the pen as far as I could down the hill and watched it disappear in the grass. It may take a few moments, Chiron told me. Now check your pocket. Sure enough, the pen was there. Okay, that's extremely cool, I admitted. But what if a mortal sees me pulling out a sword? Chiron smiled. Mist is a powerful thing, Percy. Mist? Yes, read the Iliad. It's full of references to the stuff. Whenever divine or monstrous elements mix with the mortal world, they generate mist, which obscures the vision of humans. You will see things just as they are, being a half-blood, but humans will interpret qu things quite differently. Remarkable, really, the lengths to which humans will go to fit things into their version of reality. I put Riptide back in my pocket. For the first time, the quest felt real. I was actually leaving Half-Blood Hill. I was heading west with no adult supervision, no backup plan, not even a cell phone. Chiron said cell phones were traceable by monsters. If we used one, it would be worse than sending up a flare. I had no weapon stronger than a sword to fight off monsters and reach the land of the dead. Chiron, I said, when you say the gods are immortal, I mean, there was a time before them, right? Four ages before them, actually. The time of the Titans was the Fourth Age, sometimes called the Golden Age, which is definitely a misnomer. This, the time of the West of Western civilization and the rule of Zeus, is the Fifth Age. So, what was it like before the gods? Chiron pursed his lips. Even I am not old enough to remember that, child. But I know it was a time of darkness and savagery for mortals. Kronos, the lord of the Titans, called his reign the Golden Age because men lived innocent and free of all knowledge. But that was mere propaganda. The Titan King cared nothing for your kind, except as appetizers for a source of cheap entertainment. 
It was only in the early reign of Lord Zeus when Prometheus, the good titan, brought fire to mankind that your species began to progress. And even then, Prometheus was branded a radical thinker. Zeus punished him severely, as you may recall. Of course, eventually the gods warmed to humans, and Western civilization was born. But the gods can't die now, right? I mean, as long as Western civilization is alive, they're alive. So even if I failed, nothing could happen so bad it would mess up everything, right? Chiron gave me a melancholy smile. No one knows how long the age of the West will last, Percy. The gods are immortal, yes, but then so were the Titans. They still exist, locked away in their various prisons, forced to endure endless pain and punishment, reduced in power, but still very much alive. May the fates forbid that the gods should ever suffer, suffer such a doom, or that we should ever return to the darkness and chaos of the past. All we can do, child, is follow our destiny. Our destiny, assuming we know what that is. Relax, Chiron told me. Keep a clear head, and remember... You may be about to prevent the biggest war in human history. Relax, I said. I'm very relaxed. When I got to the bottom of the hill, I looked back. Under the pine tree that used to be the Thalia, daughter of Zeus, Chiron was now standing in full horseman form, holding his bow, bow high in salute. Just your typical summer camp send-off by your typical centaur. Argus drove us out of the countryside and into the western Long Island, it felt weird to be on a highway again, Annabeth and Grover sitting next to me as if we were normal carpoolers. About two weeks at Half-Blood Hill, the real world seemed like a fantasy. I found myself staring at every McDonald's, every kid in the back of his parents' car, every billboard and shopping mall. So far, so good, I told Annabeth. Ten miles and not a single monster. She gave me an irritated look. It's bad luck to talk that way, seaweed brain. Remind me again, why do you hate me so much? I don't hate you. Could have fooled me. She folded her cap of in invisibility. Look, we're just not supposed to get along, okay? Our parents are rivals. Why? She sighed. How many reasons do you want? One time, my mom caught Poseidon with his girlfriend in Athena's temple, which is hugely disrespectful. Another time, Athena and Poseidon competed to be the patron god for the city of Athens. Your dad created some stupid saltwater spring for his gift. My mom created the olive tree. The people saw that her gift was better, so they named the city after her. They must really like olives. Oh, forget it. Now, if she'd invented pizza, that could, I could understand. I said forget it. In the front seat, Argus smiled. He didn't say anything, but one blue eye on the back of his neck winked at me. Traffic slowed us down in Queens. By the time we got into Manhattan, it was sunset and starting to rain. Argus dropped us at the Greyhound station on the Upper East Side, not far from my mom and Gabe's apartment. Taped to a mailbox was a soggy flyer with my picture on it. Have you seen this boy? I ripped it down before Annabeth and Grover could notice. Argus unloaded our bags, made sure we had got our bus tickets, then drove away, the eye on the back of his hand opening up to watch us as he pulled out of the parking lot. I thought about how close I was to my old apartment. On a normal day, my mom would be home from this candy store candy store by now. Smelly Gabe was probably up there right now, playing poker, not even missing her. Grover shuddered his, shouldered his backpack. He gazed down the street in the direction I was looking. You want to know why she married him, Percy? I stared at him. Were you reading my mind or something? Just your emotions, he shrugged. Guess I forgot to tell you that satyrs can do that. You were thinking about your stepdad and your mom, right? I nodded wondering what else Grover might have forgotten to tell me. Your mom married Gabe for you, Grover told me. You call him smelly, but you've got no idea. The guy has this aura. Yuck, I can smell him from here. I can smell traces of him on you, and you haven't even been near him for a week. Thanks, I said. Where's the nearest shower? You should be grateful, Percy. Your stepfather smells so repulsively human, he could mask the presence of any demigod. As soon as I took a whiff of inside his Camaro, I knew. Gabe had been covering your scent for years. If you hadn't lived with him every summer, you probably would have been found by monsters a long time ago. Your mom stayed with him to protect you. She was a smart lady. She must have loved you a lot to put up with that guy. If that makes you feel any better. It didn't, but I forced myself not to show it. 
I'll see her again, I thought. She isn't gone. I wondered if Grover could still read my emotions, mixed up as they were. I was glad he and Annabeth were with me, but I felt guilty that I hadn't been straight with them. I hadn't told them the real reason I'd said yes to this crazy quest. The truth was, I didn't care about retrieving Zeus's lightning bolt or saving the world, or even helping my father out of trouble. The more I thought about it, I resented Poseidon for never visiting me, for never helping my mom, never even sending a lousy child support check. He only claimed me because he needed a job done. All I cared about was my mom. Hades had taken her, unf taken her unfairly, and Hades was going to give her back. You will be betrayed by one who calls you a friend, the oracle whispered in my mind. You will fail to save what matters most in the end. Shut up, I told it. The rain kept coming down. We got restless waiting for the bus and decided to play some hacky sack with one of Grover's apples. Annabeth was unbelievable. She could bounce the apple off her knee, her elbow, her shoulder, whatever. I wasn't too bad myself. The game ended when I tossed the apple toward Grover and it got too close to, her, to his mouth. In one mega goat bite, our hacky sack disappeared, core, stem, and all. Grover blushed. He tried to apologize, but Annabeth and I were too busy cracking up. Finally, the bus came. As we stood in line to board, Grover started looking around, sniffing the air like he smelled his favorite school cafeteria delicacy, enchiladas. What is it? I asked. I don't know, he said tensely. Maybe it's nothing. But I could tell it wasn't nothing. I started looking over my shoulder, too. I was relieved when we finally got on board and found seats together in the back of the bus. We stowed our backpacks. Annabeth kept slapping her Yankees cap nervously against her thigh. As the last passengers got on, Annabeth clamped her hand on my knee. Percy. An old lady had just boarded the bus. She wore a crumpled velvet dress, lace gloves, and a shapeless orange knit hat that shadowed her face, and she carried a big paisley purse. When she tilted her head up, her black eyes glittered, and my heart skipped a beat. It was Mrs. Dodds. Older, more withered, but definitely the same evil face. I scrunched down in my seat, Behind her came two more old ladies, one in an old green hat, one in a purple hat. Otherwise, they looked exactly like Mrs. Dodds. Same gnarled hands, paisley handbags, wrinkled velvet dresses. Triplet, demon grandmothers. They sat in the front row, right behind the driver. The two on the aisle crossed their legs over the walkway, making an X. It was casual enough, but it sent a clear message. Nobody leaves. The bus pulled out of the station, and we headed through the slick streets of Manhattan, she didn't stay dead long, I said, trying to keep my voice from quivering. I thought you said they could be dispelled for a lifetime. I said, if you're lucky, Annabeth said. You're obviously not. All three of them? Grover whimpered. De immortalis? It's okay, Annabeth said, obviously, think obviously thinking hard. The Furies, the three worst monsters from the underworld? No problem, no problem. We'll just slip out of the windows. They don't open, Grover moaned. A back exit? she suggested. There wasn't one. Even if there had been, it wouldn't have helped. By that time, we were on Ninth Avenue heading for the Lincoln Tunnel. They won't attack us with witnesses around, I said. Will they? Mortals don't have good eyes, Annabeth reminded me. Their brains can only process what they see through the mist. They'll see three old ladies killing us, won't they? She thought about it. Hard to say, but we can't count on mortals for help. Maybe an emergency exit in the roof? We hit the Lincoln Tunnel, and the bus went dark, except for the running lights down the aisle. It was eerily quiet without the sound of the rain. Mrs. Dodds got up, and a flat voice, as if she'd rehearsed it, she announced to the whole bus, I need to use the restroom. So do I, said the second sister. So do I, said the third sister. They all started coming down the aisle. I've got it, Aunt Beth said. Percy, take my hat. What? You're the one they, they want. Turn invisible and go up the aisle. Let them pass in front of you. Maybe you can get, get to the bus and get away. But you guys... There's an outside chance they might not notice us, Annabeth said. You're a son of one of the big three. Your smell might be overpowering. I can't just leave you. Don't worry about us, Grover said. Go! My hands trembled. I felt like a coward, but I took the Yankees cap and put it on. When I looked down... My body wasn't there anymore. I started creeping up the aisle. I managed to get up ten rows, then duck into an empty seat, just as the Furies walked past. 
Mrs. Dodd stopped, sniffing, and looked straight at me. My heart was pounding. Apparently, she didn't see anything. She and her sisters kept going. I was free. I made it to the front of the bus. We were almost through the Lincoln Tunnel now. I was about to press the emergency stop button when I heard a hideous wailing from the back row. The old ladies were not old ladies anymore. Their faces were still the same. I guess those couldn't get any uglier. But their bodies had shriveled into leathery brown hag bodies with bat's wings and hands and feet like gargoyle claws. Their handbags had turned into fiery whips. The Furies surrounded Grant Grover and Annabeth, lashing their, their whips, hissing, Where is it? Where? The other people on the bus were screaming, cowering in their seats. They saw something all right. He's not here, Annabeth yelled. He's gone. The Furies raised their whips. Annabeth drew her bronze knife. Grover grabbed the tin can from his snack bag and prepared to throw it. What I did next was so impulsive and dangerous, I should have been named ADHD poster child of the year. The bus driver was distracted, trying to see what was going on in his rearview mirror. Still invisible, I grabbed the wheel from him and jerked it to the left. Everybody howled as they were thrown to the right, and I heard what I hoped was the sound of three furies smashing against the windows. Hey, the driver yelled. Hey, whoa! We wrestled for the wheel. The bus slammed against the side of the tunnel, grinding metal, throwing sparks a mile behind us. We careened out of the Lincoln Tunnel and back into the rainstorm. People and monsters tossed around the bus. Cars plowed aside like bowling pins. Somehow, the driver found an exit. We shot off the highway, through half a dozen traffic lights, and ended up barreling down one of those New Jersey rural roads where you can't believe there's so, mu so much nothing right across the river from New York. There were woods to our left, the Hudson River to our right, and the driver seemed to be veering toward the river. Another great idea. I hit the emergency brake. The bus wailed, spun us a full circle around a wet, on wet asphalt, and crashed into the trees. The emergency lights came on. The door flew open. The bus driver was the first one out, the passengers yelling as they stampeded after him. I stepped into the driver's seat and let them pass. The Furies regained their balance. They lashed their whips at Annabeth while she waved her knife and yelled in ancient Greek, telling them to back off. Grover threw tin cans. I looked at the open doorway. I was free to go, but I couldn't leave my friends. I took off the invisib invisible cap. Hey! The Furies turned, baring their yellow fangs at me and the exit suddenly seemed like an excellent idea. Mrs. Dodd stalked up the aisle, just as she used, used to do in my class, about to deliver my F-minus math test. Every time she flicked her whip, red flames danced along the barbed leather. Her two ugly sisters hopped on top of the seats on either side of her and crawled toward me like huge, nasty lizards. Percy, Percy is Jackson, Mrs. Dodd said, in an accent that was definitely from somewhere farther south than Georgia. You have offended the gods. You shall die. I liked you better as a math teacher, I told her. She growled. Annabeth and Grover moved up behind the Furies cautiously, looking for an opening. I took the ballpoint pen out of my pocket and uncapped it. Riptide elongated into a shimmering, double-edged sword. The Furies hesitated. Mrs. Dodds had felt Riptide's blade before. She obviously didn't like seeing it again. Submit now, she hissed and you will not suffer eternal torment. Nice try, I told her. Percy, look out, Annabeth cried. Mrs. Dodds lashed her whip around my sword hand while the furies on either side lunged at me. My hand felt like it was wrapped in molten lead, but I managed not to drop Riptide. I struck the fury on the left with its hilt, sending her toppling backward into a seat. I turned and sliced the fury on the right. As soon as the blade connected with her neck, she screamed, exploded into dust. Annabeth got Mrs. Dodds in a wrestler's hold and yanked her backward while Grover ripped the whip out of her hands. Ow, he yelled. Ow, hot, hot. The fury I'd hilt slammed came at me again, talons ready, but I swung riptide and she broke open like a pinata. Mrs. Dodds was trying to get Annabeth off her back. She kicked, clawed, hissed, and bit but Annabeth held on while Grover got Mrs. Dodd's legs tied up in her own whip. Finally, they both shoved her backward into the aisle. Mrs. Dodds tried to get up, but she didn't have room to flat her back, flap her bat wings, so she kept falling down. 
Zeus will destroy you, she promised. Hades will have your soul. Brachus meus feshiminini, I yelled. I wasn't sure where the Latin came from. I think it meant eat my pants. Thunder shook the bus. The hair rose on the back of my neck. Get out, Annabeth yelled at me. Now! I didn't need any encouragement. We rushed outside and found the other passengers wandering around in a daze, arguing with the driver, or running around in circles, yelling, We're going to die! A Hawaiian-shirted tourist with a camera snapped my photograph before I could recap my sword. Our bags, Grover realized. We left our... Boom. The windows of the bus exploded as the passengers ran for cover. Lightning shredded a huge crater and the roof, but an angry wail from inside told me Mrs. Dodds was not dead yet. Run, Annabeth said. She's calling for reinforcements. We have to get out of here. We plunged into the woods as the rain poured down, the bus in flames behind us, and nothing but darkness ahead. Chapter 11. We Visit the Garden Gnome Emporium In a way, it's nice to know there are Greek gods out there, because you have somebody to blame when things go wrong. For instance, when you're walking away from a bus that's just been attacked by monster hags and blown up by lightning, and it's raining on top of everything else, most people might think that's just really bad luck. When you're half-blood, you understand that some divine force really is trying to mess up your day. So there we were, and Beth and Grover and I walking through the woods along the New Jersey Riverbank, the glow of New York City making the night sky yellow behind us and the smell of the Hudson reeking in our noses. Grover was shivering and braying, his big goat eyes turned slit-pupiled and full of terror. Three kindly ones, all three at once. I was pretty much in shock myself. The explosion of bus windows still rang in my ear. But Annabeth kept pulling us along, saying, Come on, the farther we get, the better. All our money was back there, I reminded her. Our food and clothes, everything. Well, maybe if you hadn't decided to jump into the fight. What'd you want me to do? Get Let me get, let you get killed? You didn't need to protect me, Percy. I would have been fine. Slice like sandwich bread, Grover put in, but fine. Shut up, goat boy, said Annabeth. Grover brayed mournfully. Tin cans. A perfectly good bag of tin cans. We sloshed across mushy ground, through nasty, twisted trees that smelled like sour laundry. After a few minutes, Annabeth fell into line next to me. Look, I... Her voice faltered. I appreciate your coming back for us, okay? That was really brave. We're a team, right? She was silent for a few more steps. It's just that... If you died, aside from the fact that it would really suck for you, it would mean that the quest was over. This may be my only chance to see the real world. The thunderstorm had finally let up. The city glow f faded behind us, leaving us in almost total darkness. I couldn't see anything except Anna uh, anything of Annabeth except a glint of her blonde hair. You haven't left camp half-blood since you were seven? I asked her. No, only short field trips. My dad the history professor. Yeah, it didn't work out for me living at home. I mean, Camp Half-Blood is my home. She was rushing her words out now as if she were afraid somebody might try to stop her. At camp you train and train, and that's all cool and everything, but the real world is where the monsters are. That's where you learn whether you're any good or not. If I didn't know any better, I could have sworn I heard doubt in her voice. You're pretty good with that knife, I said. You think so? Anybody who can piggyback ride a fury is okay by me. I couldn't really see, but I thought she might have smiled. You know, she said, maybe I should tell you something funny back on the bus. Whatever she wanted to say was interrupted by a shrill toot-toot-toot, -toot, like the sound of an owl being tortured. Hey, my reed pipes still work, Grover cried. If I could just remember a fine path song, we could get out of these woods. He puffed out a few notes, but the tune still sounded suspiciously like Hilary Duff. Instead of finding a path, I immediately slammed into a tree and got a nice-sized knot on my head. Add to the list of superpowers I did not have, infrared vision. After tripping and cursing and generally feeling miserable for another mile or so, I started to see light up ahead, the colors of a neon sign. I smell food, fried, greasy, excellent food. I realized I hadn't eaten anything unhealthy since I'd arrived at Half-Blood Hill, 
where we lived on grapes, bread, cheese, and extra lean cut nymph repaired barbecue, this boy needed a double cheeseburger. We kept walking until I saw a, t- a deserted two lane road through the trees. On the other side was a closed down gas station, a tattered billboard for a 1990s movie, and one open business which was the source of the neon light and the good smell. It wasn't a fast food restaurant like I'd hoped. It was one of those weird roadside curio shops that sell lawn flamingos and wooden Indians and cement grizzly bears and stuff like that. The main building was a long, low warehouse surrounded, surrounded by acres of sanctuary. Statuary. The neon sign above the gate was impossible for me to read because if it was anything worse than my dyslexia, for my dyslexia than regular English, it's red cursive neon English. To me, it looked like What the heck does that say? I asked. I don't know, Annabeth said. She loved reading so much, I'd forgotten she was dyslexic too. Grover translated. Auntie M's Garden Gnome Emporium. Flanking the entrance, as advertised, were two cement garden gnomes, ugly bearded little runts, smiling and waving as if they were about to get their picture taken. I crossed the street, following the smell of the hamburgers. Hey, Grover warned. The lights are on inside, Annabeth said. Maybe it's it's open. Snack bar, I said wistfully. Snack bar, she agreed. Are you too crazy, Grover said. This place is weird. We ignored him. The front lot was a forest of statues. Cement animals, cement children, even a cement satyr playing the pipes, which gave Grover the creeps. Blah, he bleated. Looks like my Uncle Ferdinand. We stopped at the warehouse door. Don't knock, Grover pleaded. I smell monsters. Your nose is clogged up from the Furies, Annabeth told him. All I smell is burgers. Aren't you hungry? Meat, he said scornfully. I'm a vegetarian. You eat cheese enchiladas and aluminum cans, I reminded him. Those are vegetables. Come on, let's leave. These statues are looking at me. Then the door creaked open and standing in front of us was a tall Middle Eastern woman. At least I assumed she was Middle Eastern because she wore a long black gown that covered everything but her hands, and her head was completely veiled. Her eyes glinted behind a curtain of black gauze, but that was all about about all I could make out. Her coffee-colored hands looked old, but well manicured and elegant, so I imagined she was a grandmother who had once been a beautiful lady. Her accent sounded vaguely Middle Eastern, too. She said, Children, it is too late to be out all alone. Where are your parents? They're, um, Annabeth started to say. We're orphans, I said. Orphans, the woman said. The word sounded alien in her mouth. But, my dears, surely not. We got separated from our caravan, I said. Our circus caravan. The ringmaster told us to meet him at the gas station if we got lost, but he may have forgotten. Or maybe he meant a different gas station. Anyway, we're lost. Is that food I smell? Oh, my dears, the woman said. You must come in, poor children. I am Auntie M. Go straight through to the back of the warehouse, please. There is a dining area. We thanked her and went inside. Annabeth muttered to me, Circus caravan? Always have a strategy, right? Your head is full of kelp. The warehouse was filled with more statues, people in all different poses, wearing all different outfits and with different expressions on their faces. I was thinking you'd have to you have a pretty huge garden to fit even one of these statues because they were all life-size. But mostly, I was thinking about food. Go ahead, call me an idiot for walking into a strange lady's shop just like that because I was hungry, but I do impulsive stuff sometimes. Plus... You've never smelled Auntie M's burgers. The aroma was like laughing gas in a dentist's chair. It made everything else go away. I barely noticed Grover's nervous whimpers, or the way the statue's eyes seemed to follow me, or the fact that Auntie M had locked the door behind us. All I cared about was finding the dining area. And sure enough, there it was at the back of the warehouse, a fast food counter with a grill, a soda fountain, a pretzel heater, and a nacho cheese dispenser. Everything you could want, plus a few steel picnic tables out front. Please, sit down, said Auntie M. Awesome, I said. Um, Grover said reluctantly, 
We don't have any money, ma'am. Before I could jab him in the ribs, Auntie M said, No, no, children. No money? This is a special case, yes? It is my treat for such nice orphans. Thank you, ma'am, Annabeth said. Auntie M stiffened, as if Annabeth had done something wrong, but then the old woman had relaxed just as quickly, so I figured it must have been my imagination. Quite all right, Annabeth, she said. You have such beautiful gray eyes, child. Only later did I wonder how she knew Annabeth's name, even though we had never introduced ourselves. Our hostess disappeared behind the snack counter and started cooking. Before we knew it, she'd brought us plastic trays heaped with double cheeseburgers, vanilla shakes, and double extra-large servings of french fries. I was halfway through my burger before I could remember to breathe. Annabeth slurped her on her shake. Grover picked at his fries and eyed the tray's waxed paper liner as if he might go for that, but he still looked too nervous to eat. What's that hissing noise? he asked. I listened, but didn't hear anything. Annabeth shook her head. Hissing? Annabeth, uh, Auntie M asked. Perhaps you hear the deep fryer oil. You have keen ears, Grover. I take vitamins for my ears. That's admirable, she said. But please, relax. Auntie M ate nothing. She had taken off her headdress. She hadn't taken off her headdress, even to cook. And now she sat forward and interlaced her fingers and watched us eat. It was a little unsettling, having someone stare at me when I couldn't see her face. But I was feeling satisfied after the burger and a little sleepy. And I figured the least I could do was try to make small talk with our hostess. So, you sell gnomes, I said, trying to sound interested. Oh, yes, Auntie M said. And animals and people. Anything for the garden. Custom orders. Statuary is very popular, you know. A lot of businesses on this road? Not so much, no. Since the highway was built, most cars, they do not go this way now. I must cherish every customer I get. My neck tingled, as if somebody else was looking at me. I turned, but it was just a statue of a young girl holding an Easter basket. The detail was incredible. So much better than you see in most garden statues. But something was wrong with her face. It looked as if she were startled, even terrified. Ah, Auntie M said sadly. You notice some of my crea creations do not turn out well. They are marred. They do not sell. The face is the hardest to get right. Always the face. You make these statues yourself? I asked. Oh, yes. Once upon a time, I had two sisters to help me in the business, but they have passed on, and Auntie M is alone. I have only my statues. This is why I make them. You see? They are my company. The sadness in her voice sounded so deep and so real that I couldn't help feeling sorry for her. Annabeth had stopped eating. She sat forward and said, Two sisters? It is a terrible story, Auntie M said. Not one for children, really. You see, Annabeth, a bad woman was jealous of me long ago, when I was young. And I had a, a, a boyfriend, you know. And this bad woman was determined to break us apart. She caused a terrible accident. My sisters stayed by me. They shared my bad fortune as long as they could, but eventually they passed on. They faded away. I alone have survived, but at a price, at such a price. I wasn't sure what she meant, but I felt bad for her. My eyelids kept getting heavier, my stomach making me sleepy. Poor old lady, who would want to hurt somebody so nice? Percy, Annabeth was shaking me to get my attention. Maybe we should go. I mean, the ringmaster will be waiting. She sounded tense. I wasn't sure why. Grover was eating the waxed paper off the tray now. But if Auntie M found that strange, she didn't say anything. Such beautiful gray eyes, Annabeth told Annabeth. A Auntie M told Annabeth again. My, yes, it has been a long time since I have seen gray eyes like those. She reached out, as if to stroke Annabeth's cheek, but Annabeth stood up abruptly. We really should go. Yes, Grover swallowed his waxed paper and stood up. The ringmaster's waiting.
Right. I didn't want to leave. I felt full and content. Auntie Anne was so nice. I wanted to stay with her for a while. Please, dears, Annabeth Auntie M pleaded. I so rarely get to be with children. Before you go, won't you at least sit for a pose? A pose? Annabeth asked warily. A photograph. I will use it to model a new statue set. Children are so popular, you see. Everyone loves children. Annabeth shifted her weight from foot to foot. I don't think we can, ma'am. Uh, come on, Percy. Uh, sure we can, I said. I was irritated with Annabeth for being so bossy, so rude to an old lady who just fed us for free. It's just a photo, Annabeth. What's the matter? Yes, Annabeth, the woman purred. No harm. I could tell Annabeth didn't like it, but she allowed Auntie M to lead us back outside to the, out the front door into the Garden of Statues. Auntie M directed us to a park bench next to the stone satyr. Now, she said, I'll just position you correctly. The young girl in the middle, I think, and the two young gentlemen on either side? Not so much light for a photo, I remarked. Oh, enough, Auntie M said. Enough for us to see each other, yes? Where's your camera? Grover asked. Auntie M stepped back, as if to admire the shot. Now, the face is the most difficult. Can you smile for me, please, everyone? A large smile? Grover glanced at the cement satyr next to him and mumbled, That sure does look like Uncle Ferdinand. Grover, Auntie M chastised. Look this way, dear. She still had no camera in her hands. Percy, Annabeth said. Some instinct warned me to listen to Annabeth, but I was fighting the sleepy feeling, the comfortable lull that came from the food and from the old lady's voice. I will just be a moment, Auntie M said. You know, I can't see you very well in this cursed veil. Percy, something's wrong, Annabeth insisted. Wrong, Auntie M said, reaching up to undo the wrap around her head. Not at all, dear. I have such noble company tonight. What could be wrong? That is Uncle Ferdinand, Grover gasped. Look away from her, Annabeth shouted. She whipped her Yankees cap onto her head and vanished. Her invisible hands pushed Grover and me off the bench. I was on the ground, looking at Auntie M's sandaled feet. I could hear Grover scrambling off in one direction, Annabeth in the other, but I was too dazed to move. Then... I heard a strange rasping sound above me. My eyes rose to Auntie M's hands, which had turned gnarled and warty with sharp bronze talons for fingernails. I must look higher, but somewhere off to my left, Annabeth screamed, No, don't! More rasping. The sound of tiny snakes right above me from, well, from about where Auntie M's head would be. Run! Grover bleated. I heard him racing across the gravel, yelling, Mei! To, to kickstart his flying sneakers. I couldn't move. I stared at Auntie M's gnarled claws and tried to fight the groggy trance the old woman had put me in. Such a pity to destroy a handsome young face, she told me soothingly. Stay with me, Percy. All you have to do is look up. I fought the urge to obey. Instead, I looked to one side and saw those glass spheres people put in gardens, a gazing ball. I could see Auntie M's dark reflection in the orange glasses. Her headdress was gone, revealing her face as a shimmering pale circle. Her hair was moving, writhing like serpents. Auntie M. Auntie M. How could I have been so stupid? Think, I told myself. How did Medusa die in the myth? But I couldn't think. Something told me that in the myth, Medusa had been asleep when she was attacked by my namesake, Perseus. She wasn't anywhere near, near asleep now. If she wanted, she could take those talons right now and rake open my face. The gray-eyed one did, th did this to me, Percy, Medusa said. And she didn't sound anything like a monster. Her voice invited me to look up, to sympathize with a poor old grandmother. Annabeth's mother, the cursed Athena turned me from this, from a beautiful woman, into this. Don't listen to her, Annabeth's voice shouted from somewhere in the sanctuary. Run, Percy! Silence, Medusa snarled. Then 
Her voice modulated back to a comforting purr. You see why I must destroy the girl, Percy. She is my enemy's daughter. I shall crush her statue to dust. But you, dear Percy, you need not suffer. No, I muttered. I tried to make my legs move. Do you really want to help the gods? Annabeth asked. Medusa asked. Do you understand what awaits you on this foolish quest, Percy? What will happen if you reach the underworld? Do not be a pawn of the Olympians, my dear. You would be better off as a statue. Less pain. Less pain. Percy! Behind me, I heard a buzzing sound, like a 200-pound hummingbird and a nosedive. Grover yelled, Duck! I turned, and there he was in the night sky, flying in from 12 o'clock with his winged shoes fluttering. Grover, holding a tree branch the size of a baseball bat. His eyes were shut tight, his head twitching from side to side. He was navigating by years, ears and nose alone. Duck! He yelled again. I'll get her! That finally jolted me into action. Knowing Grover, I was sure he'd miss Medusa and nail me. I dove to one side. Thwack. At first, I figured it was the sound of Grover hitting a tree. Then Medusa roared with rage. You miserable satyr, she snarled. I'll add you to my collection. That was for Uncle Ferdinand, Grover yelled back. I scrambled away and hid in the sanctuary while Grover swooped down for another pass. Grwack. Arg! Medusa yelled, her snake hair hissing and spitting. Right next to me, Annabeth's voice said, Percy! I jumped so high my feet nearly cleared a garden gnome. Jeez, don't do that to me! Annabeth took off her Yankees cap and became visible. You have to cut her head off. What? Are you crazy? Let's get out of here! Medusa is a menace. She's evil. I'd kill her myself, but... Annabeth swallowed as if she were about to make a difficult admission. But you've got the better weapon. Besides, I'd never even get close to her. She'd slice me to bits because of my mother. You, you've got a chance. What? I can't... Look, do you want her turning more innocent people into statues? She pointed to a pair of statue lovers. A man and a woman with their arms around each other turned to stone by the monster. Annabeth grabbed a green gazing ball from a nearby pedestal. A polished shield would be better. She studied the sphere critically. The convexity will cause some distortion. The reflection size should be off by a factor of... Would you speak English? I am. She tossed the glass ball. Just... Just look at her in the glass. Never look at her directly. Hey, guys! Grover yelled from somewhere up above us. I think she's unconscious. Roar! Maybe not, Grover corrected. He went in for another pass with the tree branch. Hurry, Annabeth told me. Grover's got a great nose, but he'll eventually crash. I took out my pen and uncapped it, the bronze blade of riptide elongated in my hand. I followed the hissing and spitting sounds of Medusa's hair. I kept my eyes locked on the gazing ball so I could only glimpse Medusa's reflection, not the real thing. Then, in the green-tinted glass, I saw her. Grover was coming in for another turn to bat, but this time he flew a little too low. Medusa grabbed the stick and pulled him off course. He tumbled through the air and crashed into the arms of a stone grizzly bear with a painful oof. Medusa was about to lunge at him when I yelled, Hey! I advanced on her, which wasn't easy, holding a sword and a glass ball. If she charged, I'd have a hard time defending myself. But she let me approach, 20 feet, 10 feet. I could see the reflection of her face now. Surely it really wasn't that ugly. The green swirls of the gazing ball must have been distorting it, making it look worse. You wouldn't harm an old woman, Percy, she crooned. I know you wouldn't. I hesitated, fascinated by the face I saw reflected in the glass, the eyes that seemed to burn straight through the green tint, making my arms go weak. For the moment, for, uh, from the cement grizzly, Grover moaned, Percy, don't listen to her. Medusa cackled. Too late. She lunged at me with her talons. I slashed up with my sword, heard a sickening schlock, then a hiss like wind rushing out of the cavern, the sound of a monster disintegrating. Something fell to the ground at my foot. It took all my willpower not to look. 
I could feel warm ooze soaking into my sock, little dying snake heads tugging at my shoelaces. Oh, yuck, Rover said. His eyes were still tightly closed, but I guess he could hear the thing gurgling and steaming. Mega yuck. Annabeth came up next to me, her eyes fixed on the sky. She was holding Medusa's black veil. She said, don't move. Very, very carefully, without looking down, she knelt and draped the monster's head in black cloth, then picked it up. It was still dripping green juice. Are you okay? She asked me, her voice trembling. Yeah, I decided, though I felt like throwing up my double cheeseburger. Why didn't, why didn't the head evaporate? Once you sever it, it becomes a spoil of war, she said. Same as your minotaur horn. But don't unwrap the head. It can still petrify you. Grover moaned as he climbed down from the grisly statue. He had a big welt on his forehead. His green rasta cap hung from one of his little goat horns, and his fake feet had been knocked off his hooves. The magic sneakers were flying aimlessly around his head. The Red Baron, I said. Good job, man. He managed a bashful grin. That really was not fun, though. Well, the hitting her with a stick part, that was fun. But crashing into a concrete bear, not fun. He snatched his shoes out of the air. I recapped my sword. Together, the three of us tumbled backward to the warehouse. We found some old plastic grocery bags behind the snack counter and double-wrapped Medusa's head. We plopped it on the table where we'd eaten dinner and sat around, too exhausted to speak. Finally, I said, So we have Athena to thank for this monster? And Beth flashed me an irritated look. Your dad, actually. Don't you remember? Medusa was Poseidon's girlfriend. They decided to meet in my mother's temple. That's why Athena turned her into a monster. Medusa and her two sisters, uh, who had helped her get into the temple, they became the three Gorgons. That's why Medusa wanted to slice me, slice me up. But she wanted to preserve you as a nice statue. She's still sweet on your dad. You probably reminded her of him. My face was burning. Oh, so now it's my fault we met Medusa? Annabeth straightened. In her bad imitation of my voice, she said, It's just a photo, Annabeth. What's the harm? Forget it, I said. You're impossible. You're insufferable. You're... Hey, Grover interrupted. You two are giving me a migraine, and satyrs don't even get migraines. What are we going to do with the head? I stared at the thing. One little snake was hanging out of a hole in the plastic. The words printed on the side of the bag said, We appreciate your business. I was angry but not just with Annabeth or her mom, but with all the gods for this whole quest, for getting us blown off the road and into two major fights the very first day from camp, day out from camp. At this rate, we'd never make it to L.A. alive, much less before the summer solstice. What did, Annabeth, what did Medusa said? Do not be a pawn of the Olympians, my dear. You would be better off as a statue. I got up. I'll be back. Percy, Annabeth called after me. What do you... I searched the back of the warehouse until I found Medusa's office. Her account book showed her six most recent sales, all shipments to the underworld to decorate Hades and Persephone's garden. According to one of the freight bills, Underworld's billing address was DOA Recording Studios, West Hollywood, California. I folded up the bill and stuffed it in my pocket. The cash In the cash register, I drew out $20.00 a few golden drachmas, and found some packing slips for Hermes Overnight Express, each with a little leather bag attached for coins. I rummaged around the rest of the office until I found the right size box. I went back to the picnic table, packed up Medusa's head, and filled out a delivery slip. The gods, Mount Olympus, 600th floor, Empire State Building, New York, New York. With best wishes, Percy Jackson. They're not going to like that. Grover warned. They all think you're impertinent. I poured some golden drachmas in the pouch. As soon as I closed it, there was a sound like a cash register. The package floated off the table and disappeared with a pop. I am impertinent, I said. I looked at Annabeth, daring her to criticize. She didn't. She seemed resigned to the fact that I had a major talent for taking off the gods. Come on, she muttered. We need a new plan. Chapter 12. We Get Advice from a Poodle We were pretty miserable that night. 
We camped out in the woods, 100 yards from the main road, in a marshy clearing that local kids had obviously been using for parties. The ground was littered with flattened soda cans and fast food wrappers. We'd taken some food and blankets from Auntie M, but we didn't dare light a fire or dry our, to dry our damp clothes. The Furies and Medusa had provided enough excitement for one day. We didn't want to attract anything else. We decided to sleep in shifts. I volunteered to take first watch. Annabeth curled up on the blankets and was snoring as soon as her head hit the ground. Grover fluttered with his flying shoes to the lowest bough of a tree, put his back to the trunk, and stared at the night sky. Go ahead and sleep, I told him. I'll wake you if there's trouble. He nodded, but still didn't close his eyes. It makes me sad, Percy. What does? The fact that you signed up for this stupid quest? No, this makes me sad. He pointed at all the garbage on the ground. And the sky? You can't even see the stars. They've polluted the sky. This is a terrible time to be a satyr. Oh, yeah. I guess you'd be an environmentalist. He glared at me. Only a human wouldn't be. Your species is clogging up the world so fast. Ugh, never mind. It's useless to lecture a human. At the rate things are going, I'll never find Pan. Pam? Like the cooking spray? Pan, he cried indignantly. P-A-N. The great god Pan. What do you think I want a searcher's license for? A strange breeze rustled through the clearing, temporarily overpowering the stink of trash and muck. It brought the smell of berries and wildflowers and clean rainwater, things that might have once been in these woods. Suddenly, I was nostalgic for something I'd never known. Tell me about the search, I said. Grover looked at me cautiously, as if he were afraid I was just making fun. The god of wild places disappeared 2,000 years ago, he told me. A sailor off the coast of Ephesos heard a mysterious voice crying out from the shore, Tell them that the great god Pan has died. When humans heard the news, they believed it. They've been pillaging Pan's kingdom ever since. But for the satyrs, Pan was our lord and master. He protected us in the wild places of the earth. We refused to believe that he died. In every generation, the bravest satyrs pledged their lives to finding Pan. They searched the earth, exploring all the wildest places, hoping to find where he's hidden and wake him from his sleep. And you want to be a searcher? It's my life's dream, he said. My father was a searcher, and my uncle Ferdinand? The statue you saw back there. Oh, right, sorry. Grover shook his head. Uncle Ferdinand knew the risks. So did my dad. But I'll succeed. I'll be the first searcher to return alive. Hang on. The first? Grover shook, took his reed pipes out of his pocket. No searcher has ever come back. Once they set out, they disappear. They're never seen alive again. Not once in 2,000 years? No. And your dad? You have no idea what happened to him? None. But you still want to go? I said, amazed. I mean, you really think you'll be the one to find Pan? I have to believe that, Percy. Every searcher does. It's the only thing that keeps us from despair when we look at what humans have done to the world. I have to believe Pan can still be awakened. I stared at the orange haze of the sky and tried to understand how Grover could pursue a dream that seemed so hopeless. Then again, was I any better? How are we going to get to the, into the underworld? I asked him. I mean, what chance do we have against a god? I don't know, he admitted. But back at Medusa's, when you were searching her office, Annabeth was telling me, Oh, I forgot. Annabeth will have a plan all figured out. Don't be so hard on her, Percy. She's had a tough life, but she's a good person. After all, she forgave me. His voice faltered. What do you mean? I asked. Forgave you for what? Suddenly, Grover seemed very interested in playing notes on his pipes. Wait a minute, I said. Your first keeper job was five years ago. Annabeth has been at camp five years. She wasn't, I mean, your first assignment that went wrong? I can't talk about it, Grover said, and his quivering lower lip suggested he'd start crying if I pressed him. But as I was saying, back at Medusa's, Annabeth and I agreed there's something strange going on with this quest. Something isn't what it seems. Well, duh. I'm getting blamed for stealing the thunderbolt that Hades took. It's not what I mean, Grover said. The fear, the kindly ones, 
were sort of holding back, like Mrs. Dodds at Nancy Academy. Why did she wait so long to try to kill you? Then on the bus, they just weren't as aggressive as they could have been. They seemed plenty aggressive to me. Grover shook his head. They were screeching at us. Where is it? Where is it? Where? Asking about me, I said. Maybe. But Annabeth and I, we both got the feeling they weren't asking about a person. They said, where is it? They seemed to be asking about an object. That doesn't make sense. I know. But if we've misunderstood something about this quest, and we only have nine days to find the Master Bolt... He looked at me like he was hoping for answers, but I didn't have any. I thought about what Medusa had said. I was being used by the gods. What lay ahead of me was worse than petrification. I haven't been straight with you, I told Grover. I don't care about the Master Bolt. I agreed to go to the underworld so I could bring back my mother. Grover blew a soft note on his pipes. I know that, Percy. But are you sure that's the only reason? I'm not doing it to help my father. He doesn't care about me. I don't care about him. Grover gazed down from his tree branch. Look, Percy, I'm not as smart as Annabeth. I'm not as brave as you. But I'm pretty good at reading emotions. You're glad your dad is alive. You feel good that he's claimed you. And part of you wants to make him proud. That's why you mailed Medusa's head to Olympus. You wanted him to notice what you'd done. Yeah, well... Maybe satyr emotions work differently than human emotions. Because you're wrong. I don't care what he thinks. Grover pulled his feet up onto the branch. Okay, Percy. Whatever. Besides, I haven't done anything worth bragging about. We barely got out of New York and we're stuck here with no money and no way west. Grover looked at the night sky. Like he was thinking about that problem. How about I take first watch, huh? You get some sleep. I want to protest, but he started to play Mozart, soft and sweet, and I turned away, my eyes stinging. After a few bars of piano, con piano concerto number 12, I was asleep. In my dreams, I stood in a dark cavern before a gaping pit. Gray mist creatures churned all around me, whispering rags of smoke I somehow knew were the spirits of the dead. They tugged at my clothes, trying to pull me back, but I felt compelled to walk forward to the very edge of the chasm. Looking down made me dizzy. The pit yawned so wide and was so completely black, I knew it must be bottomless. Yet, I had a feeling that something was trying to rise from the abyss, something huge and evil. The little hero, an amused voice echoed down in the darkness. Too weak, too young, but... Perhaps you will do. The voice felt ancient, cold and heavy. It wrapped around me like sheets of lead. They have misled you, it said. Barter with me. I will give you what you want. A shimmering image hovered over the void. My mother, frozen at the moment she dissolved in a shower of gold. Her face was distorted with pain, as if the minotaur were still squeezing her neck. Her eyes looked directly at me, pleading... Go. I tried to cry out, but my voice wouldn't work. Cold laughter echoed from the chasm. An invisible force pulled me forward. It would drag me into the pit unless I stood firm. Help me rise, boy. The voice became hungrier. Bring me the bolt. Strike a blow against the treacherous gods. The spirits of the dead whispered around me. No, wake. The image of my mother began to fade. The thing in the pit tightened its unseen grip around me. I realized it wasn't interested in pulling me in. It was using me to pull itself out. Good, it murmured. Good. Wake, the dead whispered. Wake! Someone was shaking me. My eyes opened, and it was daylight. Well, Annabeth said, the zombie lives. I was trembling from the dream. I could still feel the grip of the chasm monster around my chest. How long was I asleep? Long enough for me to, to cook breakfast. Annabeth tossed a bag of nacho-flavored corn chips from Auntie M's snack bar. And Grover went exploring. Look, he found a friend. My eyes had trouble focusing. 
Grover was sitting cross-legged on a blanket with something fuzzy in his lap, a dirty, unnaturally pink stuffed animal. No, it wasn't a stuffed animal. It was a pink poodle. The poodle yapped at me suspiciously. Grover said, No, he's not. I blinked. Are you talking to that thing? The poodle growled. This thing, Grover warned, is our ticket west. Be nice to him. You can talk to animals? Grover ignored the question. Percy, meet Gladiola. Gladiola, Percy. I stared at Annabeth, figuring she'd crack up at this practical joke they were playing on me, but she looked deadly serious. I'm not saying hello to a pink poodle, I said. Forget it. Percy, Annabeth said. I said hello to the poodle. You say hello to the poodle. The poodle growled. I said hello to the poodle. Grover explained that he'd come across Gladiola in the woods and they'd struck up a conversation. The poodle had run away from a rich local family who had posted a $200 reward for his return. Gladiola didn't really want to go back to his family, but he was willing to do it if it helped meant helping if it meant helping Grover. How does Gladiola know about the reward? I asked. He read the signs, Grover said. Duh. Of course, I said. Silly me. So we turn in Gladiola, Annabeth explained in her best strategy voice. We get money and we buy tickets to Los Angeles. Simple. I thought about my dream, the whispering voices of the dead, the thing in the chasm, and my mother's face shimmering as it dissolved into gold. All that might be waiting for me in the West. Not another bus, I said warily. No, Annabeth agreed. She pointed downhill toward train tracks. I hadn't been able to see last night in the dark. There's an Amtrak station half a mile that way. According to Gladiola, the westbound train leaves at noon.